Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Revamp Founder. In this episode, we have Michael Kim joining us. Michael is the founder of Sindana Capital, which is an FOF or fund of funds. In short, he has built a fund that funds venture capital funds or VC funds. He has been in this industry for well over a decade. And in this episode, we talk about how does an FOF work? How do VC funds raise money? And what should founders know in order to raise money for their companies? This is an incredible episode. You'll get to learn a lot from this one. Do listen to it till the very end. Thank you. So, hey Michael, how are you? I hope you're doing well. Yeah, very well. Thank you. So why uh, why did you decide to build an fund of funds, or an FOF, but not a regular VC fund? Yeah, let me explain this. Um, so when I went to university, I wanted to, I went because I wanted to become a diplomat. My, uh, my father's family in Korea had been involved with the government. And as a young boy, I traveled around um, internationally uh, every summer. I would go to Japan and Korea. And, you know, I, my parents thought it was very important to have sort of a multicultural um, international experience. And so my father was a professor. Um, focused on international affairs, international relations. And so that's what I studied at, um, at Cornell, which is where I went for my university. And so after graduation, I went to Georgetown for the School of Foreign Service to become a diplomat. But then I decided I wanted to actually um, be appointed when I'm much older into the government as opposed to working in the government. So I decided to go into banking and I worked for Chase Manhattan Bank, which is now part of JP Morgan. And I was able to travel a lot when I was working at Chase. I was doing uh, basically credit analysis, looking at companies and seeing what their balance sheets and their income statements look like and how much did they could borrow. Um, so I did that for three years. I worked in London, New York, Hong Kong, and some other places. Um, so it was good experience. And then I went to business school at Wharton and uh, I wanted to get a job from uh, Wharton working for an investment bank uh, like Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. Unfortunately, I got a summer internship at uh, Morgan Stanley in the M&A group in New York. And fortunately, I received a, a full-time offer after my summer internship. And so when I graduated in business school, um, and this is a long time ago, 1997, I started off at Morgan Stanley in New York in my dream job working at uh, in the mergers and acquisitions department. And... One month later, there was an opening in San Francisco to work for the technology Lemonade group. And that was, if you remember, the first internet bubble, the late 90s, yep. when all those new internet companies were starting. And some of them went public, like Amazon, others were merged. And so I was working in the middle of that. And that was the first time I came across venture capitalists and these private companies that they funded. So um, in 2000, I joined a venture capital firm in Los Angeles um, called Rustic Canyon. And I did that for nine years, although I was always based here in San Francisco. And at the same time, um, the mayor of San Francisco uh, at the time was Gavin Newsom, who is right now the California uh, governor. And he appointed me to the board of a public pension fund. Um, and so I did that as a volunteer. That was the first time I was on the LP side of the table. And LP you know, means limited partner. It's the groups that are investing in funds. And so we learned a lot. I learned a lot about asset allocation, you know, how much in public equities, fixed income, real estate, venture capital, private equity. And by 2009 or 10, I decided I'm going to start my own firm. So I launched Sendata Capital. And so Sendata Capital, as you mentioned, is a fund of funds. So I have investors who invest in my funds. And then I take that capital and I invest it in much smaller VC funds. So in a way, I'm aggregating capital and then I'm finding great fund managers to invest in. And we're very unique because from the beginning, over 10 years ago, we focused on seed funds. And back then there were not many seed funds. You know, these funds today are maybe a hundred million in size. They're writing the first check. You know, seed round in the US today is maybe $4 million. And our fund managers are um, writing two to $3 million checks and they're getting 10 to 15% ownership. And you know, today we have over 2 billion under management. Our investors are university endowments, private foundations, and very large family offices. 
So that's hopefully a, a good overview of what we do. We, as you're talking before we started, uh, we invest globally. So we do have fund managers, for example, in India. Um, but you know, the bulk of our investing is in the U.S. But we have fund managers in Prague, in Berlin, London, Sao Paulo, Singapore, um, and um, and in Toronto. So you know, we are actively looking outside the U.S. as well. Why do you think our uh, we see a fund of funds better than just direct connection between an LP and a normal VC fund? Because that creates an extra layer of uh, to go through. Okay, uh, there's a couple parts to that answer. Um, for one thing, you know, in my in my fund of funds, I let's say it's 300 million in size. We invested over three years into these into these funds, and they are investing over two to three years. So in a way, we're capturing five to six years, what we call vintage years, five to six vintage years of companies. Um, but if you remember, like in 2021, when people were invest when investors were investing pretty fast, they would often invest their fund all in one year. So I actually provide through a fund of funds much more diversification by time. And then also because we're investing in a number of funds, um, my my fund of funds probably has 1,000 companies, and so you have diversification by number of companies, and then of course diversification by geography and by sector. And so with all that. All that diversification means lower risk, at least in our minds. And let me explain it in a different way. If you had a continuum of risk and reward, you know, if you invested in one company, more than likely that's going to be a zero. But on the very small probability that it's the next Facebook, then suddenly you've done very well. In the middle are venture capital funds, and they invest in 30 to 40 companies, so they have a little bit more diversification. But like I was saying, at the, at the end of my, con, uh, you know, where I am on that continuum, we have over a thousand companies and we're diversified by time, geography, and sector. So I think we provide a lot lower risk. And then another way to answer your question is that when we look at some of my investors, you know, one of them is the University of Texas. They have a, over a $60 billion endowment and they need to write larger checks. You know, they can't write 10 million into a, a small seed fund. They have to write 100, 200 million dollar checks. So they actually can't access these small funds. Um, if you take a family office or a, founda- a private foundation, oftentimes they don't have a large investment staff. And so in a way they're outsourcing their investing to me. Um, so those are some of the reasons why, you know, people use fund to funds. Um, you know, some of my other investors use us because they want to meet, they want us to to uh, filter and find the best seed funds. And then my investors come in directly into those as well. So we help unearth or we help search for the best seed funds. And my investors are investing directly into that. And we we encourage that. Makes sense. That's very much so. How do you, when you invest in a, VC fund. Do you look at the thesis or the or the actual fund manager? Yeah, we look at a lot of things. Um, we invest in first time funds, but we don't invest in first time investors. So when we're looking at a, a potential investor, we look at their track record. Um, maybe they were an angel investor. Maybe they made 10, 20, 30 investments uh, using their own, in, own, own capital. Um, we, we look very much for is their networks. So we think about things in network. And so you might have someone who was very early on at Stripe. And so they know all the the founders of Stripe. They know the first 100, 200 employees. And ultimately at all these larger private companies, people ultimately leave, start their own companies, maybe start their own funds. And so you can imagine um, where there's different networks, uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, uh, Stripe, you know, groups like that. Um, so I would say that, uh, the majority of the funds that we invest in are people who have that experience working at companies. Uh, certainly, uh, a lot of them have started their own companies. So they were startup founders themselves. And so if I can give any advice, it is that in venture capital operating experience is very valuable. Um, because when you're competing for a deal, 
and um, you know, let's say the founder is in fintech, and so they want to work with other with the fund managers who have that ex, uh, domain expertise, the operating experience, and also uh, who have that empathy of a startup founder. You know, because it's very very difficult, and it's late hours like you you're experiencing right now, um, and. You know, I, I think um, it, it's 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 that that type of sort of experience that is very very important. So you know, coming out of a university, you may want to go work for a company for a few years, and then maybe you know you work for a startup that um, is becomes you know mid size or even big big, and then ultimately you could leave and potentially join a venture capital firm because on the flip side, the venture capital firm they're looking for people who have the operating experience. They're not looking necessarily for, an, at least for the younger people, they're not looking for someone who has a lot of investing experience, but they, they need to win the deals and founders want to work with people who know what they're talking about. That's that's a good point. Related to this, we're talking a little bit about the track record. Yep. So let's say if a person wants to build a VC fund, do you think having a finance degree as a, track record is a prerequisite. Well, when I say track record, it's actually making uh, a, a, a record of making investments into interesting yes. companies. And then, you know, these companies ideally have raised their seed round and then their series A and then their series B. So it may take a few years to see how well these companies do. Um, what we also look for is who are the other investors. And so, you know, uh, for example, was, you know, this company in, uh, did Sequoia or Axel do the series A or B? Um, that's usually a sign that the company is very promising. So, you know, we look at a lot of intangibles. Um, and then when we look for, you know, I talked about networks, but also when we look at a fund, we think about, and we talk, a, we talk very uh, often with the fund manager about their portfolio construction. And what that means is, let's say you had a $100 million fund, um, what's your initial check? Is it 100K? Is it 500K? Is it 2 million? Is it 4 million? Because that determines how many companies are going to be in that portfolio. So are you going to have 500 companies? Or are you going to have a 100? Or are you going to have 10? Or are you going to have like 25 to 35? So generally speaking, like I said, our fund managers are writing two to $3 million checks. So let's say if you had 100, just to make the math easy, let's say you had... um. A th you know, you're writing $3 million initial checks, you're getting 15% ownership for that initially. And then, you know, you have a portfolio of three co 30 companies. So three times 30 is 90. And then you want to have some reserves for the next round, but it doesn't have to be, you know, the same amount as the initial check. So we see sometimes uh, seed funds being closer to 150 million in size. Um, but so that's actually what we think about. We think about more concentrated portfolios, relatively high ownership. Um, the other thing that we see also is that first time funds are generally smaller. You know, we, we've invested in funds as small as 5 million in size. Um, and then, you know, they, they, in a five, $5 million fund, they're maybe writing 100, 200 K checks, you know, and then, you know, they're not going to be able to lead the round, but the, if they can get into the good deals, that shows promise. Um, and then when they raise the next fund, maybe it's 25, 40 million, 50 million in size. If it's 50 million, in, if you go from 5 million to 50 million, you have to be able to prove to your investors that you can write bigger checks. So now you have to write $1 million checks to 25 companies or 30 companies, and then have the rest of the fund as reserves. So it's easy to say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to write $1 million checks. That's very easy to say. But when it comes to a very competitive deal where all the beast, you know, different seed funds want to get in and it's only a $3 million round, you have to show that the fountain, to the founder that they need you, that you're going to add value, that you have domain expertise, you have experience, you have the networks that can help the company. Because if a founder can choose amongst all these different options, you know, to, for a $1 million check, um, you you really have to have that sort of track record, that life experience, that work experience. 
that's totally different than like if you're a tiny fund and you're writing 100k checks. The founder will say, yeah, yeah, a couple you, you can invest. But when you go from one 100k to one million check sizes, you really have to show that you can add value to the founder. Yeah, this is so. To summarize, if if the fund is it's a relatively small fund, in the and there are a lot of funds competing for the same deal then the founder has a lot of options whereas in bigger funds the first part is not there yeah that's right i mean i think you basically have to um be able to prove your worth yeah. uh, it, it, as you write larger checks because if the you know our, our fund managers are, are with the larger funds um they're writing three million dollar checks into a $4 million round. So they're basically taking almost all of the round. So they need to show, the founder has to be convinced that, that that's the right person, that's the right VC they want to work with. Yep, that, that's interesting too. I, I'll switch, switch it roughly a little bit. So how do all the people related to this is a very like basic question that I was talking about. In every part of a, VCD, let's call it that. How do how does the each how does each person make money? Talking about LPs, GPs, and then the founders. I'll give you an example. So yeah. we have a fund manager uh, called Mucker Capital. They're in Los Angeles. Their first fund was twelve million in size. They invested in a company called Honey, uh, which does. It's basically a, a browser plugin that shows all the different coupons um, for e-commerce sites. And PayPal bought them for $4 billion in cash. But Mucker owns 7% of that. So 7% of $4 billion is $280 million. That's 22x the $12 million fund size. So we, we, we received a 22x return on our investment into Mucker's fund. But... It, the the two co-founders of Mucker, they uh, they get carried interest, and what carried interest is is a percentage of the profits. So in carried interest, or people call it carry. Carry uh, for Mucker was twenty percent. So twenty percent of two hundred eighty million is fifty six million. So the two co-founders made fifty six million dollars from that one investment from a twelve million dollar fund. Now th that's an extreme example. Most venture deals don't sell for four billion. The average is less than one hundred million. But you, I use that as, as an example to show how, as an LP, we made a twenty-two x return, and how the VCs made, um, you know, life-changing money, fifty-six million dollars from a from a small fund, from a twelve million dollar fund. Now, of course, the founder founders of that company they own over you know thirty percent of that company or more, so they made. Um, you know, they, they made over a billion dollars. So, you know, if you're, there's plenty of examples of founders who've done well, but that hope that example hopefully shows to you, to, to you that how uh, an LP would make money and also how the VC makes money. Yep. That's, that, that's, that was a great example. So are VCs only looking for exits? Well, that's the, uh, the answer is yes. And that's because VCs are investors um, who have LPs and LPs want a return. Now, VC funds are typically 10 years plus two one-year extensions. So basically a 12-year life cycle. A VC fund is 12 years. And so, you know, in the first three or four years, they're making investments. And then hopefully uh, a number of them are increasing in value. Their, you know, their revenue goes up. They're bigger, uh, new investors come in at a higher valuation. And then ultimately, in the ideal world, the company goes public um, or it's acquired by a big, bigger public technology company. Um, the typical outcome is acquisition. It's not IPO. And right now, because the volatility in the public equity markets, IPOs have been very rare. Um, so that's called the IPO window. Do you think the window for IPOs is going to open? And perhaps, you know, uh, in the next six to 12 months, you'll see more technology companies going public 
you know, like a stripe or a chime, or something like that. Um, but yes, the answer is uh, that VCs need to be able to return capital. That's a distribution. So, you know, in that case, they, of Mucker, they, they sold, the company got quite sold. Um, they got the, they got the 280 million and they sent back, you know, us, uh, and our, uh, the other investors over 200 million of cash. So we we're all happy. Um, and that's the, that, that is the job of a venture capitalist is that they're an investor and they need to make distributions. Now there are other things that go on. Um, one, el one element is called secondaries and that's where you can actually sell your, your, the stock that you own to someone else, even though the company's still private. But you need the permission of the company's founders. You need the permission of the board. You need permission of the other investors. But um, I would say that the seeds, the seed funds have a lot more opportunity to sell because, you know, in a, presumably in a good company, a lot of uh, larger investors want to come in. So these small funds, if they sell 20%, 30% of their position, you know, over time, uh, they could actually return substantial amount of capital. Um, to their investors, even though the company still hasn't gone public or been acquired. Yes, that's that's a great answer. So we are talking a lot about early stage funds here. So how does a fund manager decide what the size of the fund should be? Well, fund size often determines strategy. So yeah. Then you also have to, as we talked about, are you going to be able to write 100K checks, $1 million checks, or $3 million checks? And then you have to think, how many companies do I want? Do I want 10? Do I want 100? Do I want 30? So the reason why the number of companies is important is because oftentimes fund managers, you know, it, it may be one or two people. And so the founders want you to work closely with them. And so you can't really invest in a hundred companies a year because you don't have enough time to work with each of the companies. So scalability of your bandwidth, of your time bandwidth is super important. And so if you're going to be more hands-on, then you probably have fewer companies. But in general, our fund managers have somewhere between 25 to 35 companies. And, you know, so then, then the question is, okay, if you're going to work on 30 companies, what kind of check size can you get into it? So again, I was talking about one, two, three million dollars. So if you can get what, if you're confident that you can get 500K checks in, then that's 15 million initial investing. Uh, and then you probably want to have another five to 10 million of reserves for follow on. So then your fund is more like 20, 25 million. But if you're going to be reading the big seed rounds and you're writing $3 million checks to 30 companies, that's 90 million. And then again, you need reserves. So let's say that's a $150 million fund. Now that's all, you know, like a bottoms up analysis, but the, then you have to have reality, which is, do you have the credibility to go raise the funds that you want to raise? Like if you're, if you're brand new to venture, no work experience, no investing experience and you say, oh, I want to raise a $150 million fund. That's probably not going to happen, right? And the typical path is that people raise smaller funds, show that they can get into good deals, and then they raise a little bit larger. So, you know, plenty of our fund managers started off with funds that are sub 30 million in size, sub 40 million in size. You know, the Mucker example I just gave you, their first fund was 12 million, right? So, you know, you really got to think about number of companies, check size, and the credibility you have to raise that capital. Your first fund size was twenty-eight million. Yeah, I'm not. Wait, well, it was twenty-eight plus. I also the University of Texas uh, in a separate vehicle gave me sixty. So in total, I had eighty-eight. That's but, a, yeah, my first fund was uh, first and Donna fund was uh, twenty-eight million. So that's a. Pretty relatively a pretty big fund. So, yeah, but uh, yeah. the 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 fund that we're investing out of right now is three hundred thirty million. So, you know, our fund sizes have gotten bigger, and they've gotten bigger because you know we write ten twenty million dollar checks to these funds, and these funds have gotten bigger over time. When I started Sendata, 
seed rounds were like one to two million in size. So, you know, investors were writing $1 million check sizes to 30 companies. So, you know, it was much smaller. And today, as I mentioned, the average seed round in the US is closer to 4 million. So our fund managers are now writing $3 million checks. So you can see why the fund managers have gotten bigger. So we've gotten bigger to write larger checks to them. How does a fund grow its size? So you started at 28 million. Now you're at 33, 300 million. Yeah. How do you grow from that there, there to the year? Well, it takes time. You have to show that you, uh, you're you executing on your strategy. But, you know, each fund is separate. So our fund one was 28 million. Our fund two was 50 million. Our fund three was 80 million and so forth. So over time, they've gotten larger, but they're separate funds. And, it's, and we raised a new fund probably every two to three years. So it's not... It's not, it's just to be clear, it's not like one fund and then you just add more capital to it. It's, it's separate funds. So like, this is just something that might come to a lot of people's mind. So if you have a fund, your fund one, if you have some money left after you invested in all the companies that you wanted to, do you carry that over to the second fund? Oh. Do you use it? Each, each fund is its own thing. And what we do is spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, if we had 100, if we had a fund, let's just, to make the numbers easy, if you had a $100 million fund, you want to invest in 10 funds, $10 million. So you want to actually invest the whole thing. Yeah. You don't want to, you don't want to just leave 20 million sitting around. So basically we do a lot of planning. It's what we call our forward calendar. We think about what funds are coming up over the next few years, and then we basically create a budget for it now that always changes because the fund manager might raise sooner or later um they might change the fund size so and then uh we also have to have uh open spots for new fund managers yep that's so how do you how many this is something which i'm asking for a follow-up question how many funds do you deny before accepting sounds uh, that's a good question. We we because we're pretty well known uh, as focused on the seed space. We get a lot of incoming emails from uh, new fund managers, um, and I think we probably see you know six hundred eight six to seven hundred new fund managers a year, and we probably invest in two or three of them. Now, um, that's for our our, our core strategy. Uh, a few years ago, we started um, a program called the Pilot Program, where we invest $1 million uh, into fund managers because we like the fund manager, but we want to see how things develop. Like maybe they're in a new geography or maybe they're in a new sector. So, you know, we did that with FinTech. We did that with Digital Health. We did that with Los Angeles. We did that with Boston. Um, we did that with Sao Paulo. So... You know, that's almost like an experimental check, although we don't view it as an experiment. It, we, In a way, we we and the fund manager view it as an on-ramp to ultimately becoming a core check, which, like I said, was 10 to 20 million. Um, so we, we usually add five or six of those every two years. Um, and then I, I think um, two years ago, we started what we call the nano program. And the nano program was to focus on funds that were very small, sub 20 million in size. And the reason why is that over the past five or six years, a lot of founders would have like side funds. You know, AngelList made it easy to have your own little fund. And so a lot of founders had five, $10 million funds. And as I was talking about earlier, you know, if you're a founder, you want other founders involved because they know that they, they've gone through that experience. And so a lot of these founders with these side funds are getting into the best deals. And basically LPs were not going after those. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we could invest. We had a way of investing in these founders. And, and, and an important point here is that um, generally speaking, LPs want to invest in fund managers who are working full time, right? If you're going to give someone money, you want them to work 110% of their time on this. 
Um, but the, what I'm describing with Nano is that oftentimes these founders have a full-time job running their own company and these funds are more like side funds. So, you know, we're, I think we're still the only institutional LP that's investing in these small funds like that. And so we're adding, you know, three to four of these a year. Um, so basically, I, I guess I'm saying that with Pilot, with Nano, we're probably adding, you know, five, five new names a year. And then with our core checks, we're probably adding one to two new names a year. But we probably see seven, seven, eight hundred of these. Uh, so it's a small percentage, very small percentage. So when we talk a little bit about LPs, so when you were raising your fund, how did you meet LPs? That's the ah. Was how do you get in touch with LPs? They are mostly they are rich, wealthy. No offense, but old people. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, some of them are, but they're all very. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that, you know, university endowments are um, are oftentimes very large pools of capital, and they have full time professional staff, and so their job is to find new opportunities to invest in. So you can, you can, you know, email Harvard University's endowment and try to get a meeting. Now, if they have no interest in your area of focus, then it's a short discussion. They'll just say it's not a fit, but they might be in interested in what you're doing and they might take a first meeting. Um, and and um, there are also consulting firms like Cambridge Associates. So Cambridge Associates works with a lot of uh, foundations and family offices and it provides advice on what funds to invest in. So early on, I spent time with Cambridge Associates. They understood my strategy. They had clients who were interested in it. So, you know, they brought on a number of their clients as LPs of ours. Um, family offices are actually the hardest to penetrate because oftentimes, you know, they won't, they, the, the, oftentimes they're very cutting edge in their thinking, but they generally uh, would prefer to have a trusted person make the introduction so alarming yeah a very warm intro and so one fundraising strategy is when you're talking to investors ask them for other introductions to uh, uh, ask them for introductions to other lps so if, if one family office likes your strategy then you can say oh do you have other ideas other family offices that you think might be interested in my fund so it, it it's very time consuming. There's no easy way to do it. Um, but the institutional investors, like again, the endowments, the consulting firms, the foundations, they have professional staff and it's their job to find new invest new investment opportunities. So do you think it's in is it's easier to raise money for a startup or raise money for a venture fund? Ah, that's a good question. I think it's probably easier to raise money for a startup. I mean, in the US, there are 2,000 seed funds and they're all looking for investments. So if you have a good idea and you're raising two, $3 million, you should be able to raise that. It's harder now than it was in 2021. But I think, um, you know, a lot of, I think founders should be able to raise two to 3 million if they have a good idea, if they have a good team. With a fund, you know, the fact is, if there's 2,000 VC seed funds investing in, in companies, um, there are a lot less funds and they go, they're the funds, uh, an investor is probably going to invest in five funds a year. But, the, uh, but again, a VC might be investing in 10 to 20 companies a year, right? So there's just more shots on goal. And so there's greater volume for a company. When do you think will we reach a point where when you ask a child what does he want to do when he grows up, he will say, I want to become a VC? Do you think there will be a point in time? I mean, I, in general, I think um, the venture capital market is very, very, very small compared to private equity, compared to hedge funds, compared to mutual funds, compared to investment banking, commercial banking. So um, a young person may not have exposure to venture capital. 
uh, unless they're living in a household or an area where people are talking about it. Now, obviously in the past 10 years, you know, I think a lot more people wanted, uh, are interested in startups. And because of that, they're more interested in venture capital. And I think one of the, one of the catalysts actually was the Facebook movie, because that's when a lot of people, younger people saw, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was a student at Harvard. He dropped out to start this company. And so I think, you know, a lot of younger people now, instead of going into consulting or investment banking, they want to join a startup. So, you know, I, I think, and, and, you know, uh, very young people are interested in startups. My daughter is 15 years old. She's very interested in sustainability startups. So, you know, I think if you are sort of in that, um, in that world and you hear about it, um, and in, an increasing number of people are, you know, you start thinking about startups, you think about, well, who are the investors? They're venture capitalists. Then you start thinking about BC. And then, you know, like I was saying earlier on, the best path into venture is to get operating experience, to work for a company um, and to have that experience. Yep, we talked before the recording about how I actually got into startups. I think, yeah, it's the same thing. I initially got into startups because of the Zomato IPO thing. Right. And then I got into VC, or learning more about venture capital. Yeah, and a lot more is written about it now. Like, 20 years ago, not much was written about venture capital, but now you have a lot of VCs writing blog posts, talking about how they think about things. And so there's a lot more transparency and a lot of really um, educational posts uh, explaining to the world what they do and how they think about things. So I think it's, it's, it's a much different kind of opportunity now than it was, say, 20 years ago. Yeah, that's for sure. Opportunities have increased a lot. Talking about 20 years ago, I want to ask you, you were the top 2% people in Call of Duty at one, at, at one point of time. Yeah. How do you think does that relate with competitiveness as a startup founder and as a... Yeah, you know, a, a few years ago, I was playing Call of Duty on my Xbox and I'd play maybe 30 minutes a day at night just to uh, relax and calm down. And, you know, I think there's something to be said about persistence and grit and determination. You know, you have to be very, if you're going to start a company, you have to be very passionate about what you want to do. You don't want to just do it because your friends are doing it. You really have to believe in what you're doing and you have to be able uh, not to give up. And for me, I'll give you a specific example, you know, when I was raising my first fund, pretty much everybody said no. You know, everyone I pitched to raise capital from said no. But a few people believed in what I was doing, and that's how we got going. But, you know, if you're a kind of a person where if you get discouraged when everybody's telling you no, then maybe it's not the right thing for you. So I think persistence determination and grit are super important. You know, in anything that you do and you want to do well, you can't give up. Now, of course, you have to be re re logical also. Like, you, you don't want to try to raise a fund for the next five years and, you know, run out of money and, um, you know, you don't have a place to live. <laughs> you end up homeless. You don't want to do that. But, you know, I think you can't just give up after a few no's. You have to keep going. Then he, but you have to really believe in what you're doing. When do you think is the right time to give up? Because people were talking about never giving up, but sensibly well, speaking, yeah, practical. Like if you if you imagine if you had a, um, a family, you know, you have your spouse and you have a, a young child, you need to be able to um, provide housing and food, right? And if Maybe you, you have some savings and you can try to fundraise for one year or two years. But then after that, you need to get a job because you need to pay rent or your mortgage or, you know, pay for groceries. So there's a practical element to this, of course. Um, but, you know, I my main point here is that you don't give up after a few no's um, in fundraising, You have if you, especially if you believe in what you're doing. That's... I think that 
it from my side. I think I don't have any follow up questions. Okay. That. Well, this anything is you'd like to say? No, I think it's great that uh, as a young person that you're doing this, that you're learning it, and you know, um, helping others hear uh, from different people around the world. So, congratulations to you. Thank you very much on that. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh,